Hi, and uh, welcome to this video on random projections, which is a continuation of our study of uh, dimensionality reduction. So as we motivated in the last couple of videos, uh, dimensionality reduction is basically a technique for taking data that has many features and compressing them into data that has just few features, uh, perhaps removing redundancies and noise or, and so on. And just this reduction of the number of features may help speed up algorithms in particular if your data has a lot of features to begin with. If you can reduce it to a much smaller number of features, the running time of your algorithms might improve. But also, if you can reduce to just two or three dimensions, two or three features, maybe you can uh, plot the data easier and so forth. Right. So we already motivated this in the previous video, so I'll, I'll not spend too much time on it here. Uh, what we saw then, uh, one of the approaches that we already saw was PCA, or Principal Component Analysis. So here the idea is that if I have a data matrix X, as we've seen, right, the data matrix X is the matrix that has all the N input uh, points of each of X as rows. And if I compute the matrix X transpose X, and then from this matrix, I compute the eigenvectors and eigenvalues. And then I choose uh, these basis vectors that one to set K correspond to the K eigenvectors with the, with the largest eigenvalues of X transpose X. Then in PCA, what we do is we take a feature vector and we embed it to uh, basically the projection of X onto the span of Z1 to ZK, which can be computed like this. And uh, we saw that this choice of Z1 to ZK minimizes the squared loss of the projection. So uh, the average or the sum over all the points of the uh, squared distance between the original point and the projected point. So as here, right, the X minus P here is the, is the vector, the, the loss in the projection in some sense, the mistake that we make by projecting onto a subspace, and it's the sum of squared length of these projections that we're minimizing in PCA. Right, over all choices of Z1 to ZK being a unit length orthogonal vectors, right? <clears throat> and we could also, uh, the, the basic point is that we can basically represent the projected point just by writing it in the basis. So now we only have K features instead of, for instance, the original D features, uh, for instance, MNIST had 784 uh, pixels, so meaning 784 uh, dimensional vectors, and you can project them onto much fewer dimensions and still uh, roughly preserve most of the structure in the data. Okay, so this was PCA. And then we also saw that uh, PCA uh, might have some limitations. In particular, it's a linear embedding. So, so even though this is, is just uh, Kind of exaggerated example. If your data is not has some nonlinear structure and you embed uh, linearly, then you know your PCA will always draw a line and project onto the line. Uh, then you lose a lot of the information here. So somehow maybe the position along the curve would be a better uh, representation of the data and so forth. And so we motivated this a bit to say, well, maybe we want nonlinear embeddings. And here one choice with the autoencoders that we also saw. Uh, which are neural nets that have this special bottleneck layer. So in comes a feature vector, it passes through the network. And the hope is that the output of the neural net is the same as the input feature vector. And the basic idea is that we have this bottleneck layer here in the middle with just few uh, uh, neurons. Then we could use the output of those neurons as our new feature vectors because they should contain the information about X. So that's the basic idea with autoencoders. And you can also have uh, say, ReLU activation in the neurons to make it a nonlinear uh, model. Okay, so this also has some limitations, and I'll try which will motivate uh, these random projections that we're going to see next. So, for instance, one could take the MNIST data set and try to uh, pass it through a network and uh, maybe have uh, just two neurons in this hidden layer. And if you plot these evaluations of these neurons on the digits in the MNIST data set, and then you get something that looks kind of like this. So here, uh, each of the colors represent uh, the different digits, zero through nine. And what you can see is that though it seems that uh, this autoencoder that we uh, pass this data through, it, it does seem to map the same class uh, near each other, but there are also different classes, the characters from different, uh, correspond to different digits that are kind of mapped on top of each other as well. And well, of course, this is mapped to 2D, maybe we should just have more dimensions, this would naturally help, but it's just, the point here is just that the distance between embedded points, uh, between embeddings of, of these vectors, uh, does not necessarily resemble the original distance. Right? It, it could easily be the case that things that were far apart before are now close together, or things that were close together are now far apart. Okay, so so this is one issue, say, with uh, with autoencoders. If you if you're actually interested in preserving, say, distances between points of vectors. <clears throat> 
And, and basically what this auto encoder does is it really just optimizes for decoding, right? It, it just tries to do the best that it can at reconstructing the original BJ vectors. And it can do so in any way it likes. It doesn't need to preserve, say, the geometry or the distance between feature vectors after you embed them. Okay. So uh, PCA also aims, the goal in PCA was, again, to have a small loss in the reconstruction, right? We motivated by saying that we want to uh, minimize the sum of square distances between the original point and the projected points. So... <clears throat> but but this is not the same as saying that I want to preserve the distance between all the feature vectors in my embedding. It just says that if I map embed down and then map back up, then the average of these square distances is, is as small as possible between the projected points and the original points. Okay, so, so this is one of the limitations and uh, the focus of the day or the motivation uh, is so-called random projections here. And uh, in particular, uh, we look at the so-called johnson dinstraus transform dating back to 1984. And the goal here is that we still want to do uh, dimensionality reduction. We want to map our data into fewer dimensions. Uh, but what the, the key property that we want is that, well, these feature vectors, if you look at their distance, the Euclidean distance, okay, so the normal distance between points, and then we would like that these distances are preserved after embedding. So formally, we say that for any two points in our data set, xi and xj, we would like that the square distance, so the distance after embedding, if we square it, should be very close to the original distance. Uh, so here's the embedded distance, sorry, f of xi is supposed to be the embedded version of xi, and f of xj is the embedded version of xj. The distance between the two embedded vectors should be close to the original distance. Here we work with the square. You can just take square root on both sides, and of course it still holds. Working with the square just makes uh, some of the arguments of the math simpler in, in the following uh, slides. So we'll work with the square distance, but uh, it's basically going to be the same uh, throughout. So for instance, right, if we think about projecting onto this line that we see here, then perhaps these two points, right, they will be mapped to these two points over here. And you can see in this case, right, the distance between them after embedding is pretty much the same as before, right? So. So this is basically, uh, this is nice. This is what we like. But on the other hand, if we look at these two points here, they're actually quite far apart before the embedding. But after the embedding, they're very close to each other. So this is really what we'd like to avoid with these uh, John Lindstrass transforms of random projections. Okay, so that's the basic goal that we set out to, to achieve. So the John Lindstrass transform says that, okay, you have N vectors, that's your input training data, and they have D features. Okay, and now here's a long statement. We'll sp spend some time trying to pass it. Okay, so what does it say? So it says, I can give you a precision epsilon. So this is a parameter you as a user, so to say, can, can specify. And then for any such precision epsilon, it says that, well, there's a way to construct a mapping that goes from these D-dimensional feature vectors into just K-dimensional feature vectors. K is not too large. Okay, so there's a constant of eight. Okay, and then there's a one over epsilon squared dependency here on the epsilon parameter, right? So the more precise you want it, the worse the number of dimensions is. And then there's a log of the number of points. Okay, so if you embed into this many uh, dimensions, so you can project into K dimensions, then what happens? It says that, well, for all of the data points in your input, all these uh, pairs of points, xi, xj, in the middle here, we have the the distance between them after embedding, even the squared distance. And what we're saying is that this distance has to be at least, over here we have the original squared distance times one minus epsilon. And over here on the right, we have the original distance times one plus epsilon. Of course, you can still take square root on the whole expression. It will just say the distance, if you like that better, the square root of one plus epsilon and the square root of one minus epsilon is basically one plus epsilon and one minus epsilon. Okay, the square root doesn't, it only affects the epsilon basically by a factor two. Okay, so that's just something to be aware of. Uh, so, so this is the statement that you, uh, if we say it in words, if I have n feature vectors, then I can embed them into about eight times one or epsilon squared log n dimensions. And the guarantee that I get is that all the pairwise distances between the points are preserved, so they're the same as they were before, to within this factor of one plus minus epsilon, right? So may say I want a 10% accuracy it can only differ by 10% from before, I should set epsilon to be 
right? So it's a quite surprising statement. And maybe if we think a little bit more about it, uh, these feature vectors, right? If the input dimension could be millions, and right? you could have millions of dimensions, let's say really large, uh, re high resolution images, for instance. And if the Euclidean distance makes sense for this type of data preserving Euclidean distance, then and basically, you can see here that the number of dimensions k that we require does not even depend on the original number of dimensions, right? So if we had a million dimensions before, uh, it doesn't matter. All we need is a dependency on this epsilon and a logarithmic dependency on the number of vectors that we have it in the input. Okay, so, so this sounds quite surprising. That doesn't even depend on how many dimensions we had originally. Okay. Now, okay, so this johnson strauss transform it basically says there exists a mapping. So the question is, of course, how? You know, what is the mapping? How do we compute these embeddings? And this is what we'll try to focus on uh, next. So let me first give you the original construction. The original construction says that, okay, so let's, you know, uh, write our data as the, the standard data matrix that we're used to, have all the feature vectors as rows, and let's define a matrix set having columns set one to set K, similar to PCA. We also had a, here this matrix set that we use for projection uh, was the one with the, these uh, eigenvectors as columns. What we're gonna do here is, in the original formulation of this John strauss transform, what you do is you project onto a random subspace of dimensions uh, K. And this, this constant eight is just the best known constant and, and you know, it could, perhaps it can be improved. So you project onto a random subspace and then after projection, you scale up these vectors by a factor square root d over k. Now, what does this mean to pick a random subspace? It means that you pick these z1 to z k, these columns, the basis vectors, as random unit length and orthogonal vectors. Okay, so you have to be orthogonal, they have to be random unit length. You pick those and put them into the matrix. And then the way you project your data is just to compute the product x times z, as you can see here, right, so X is an N by D matrix, and Z here is a D by K matrix. So N by D times D by K becomes an N by K matrix. And moreover, right, if you look at what is the, if you look at one of the rows of X times Z, then that row has the inner product between XI and Z1 as the first coordinate, Z against Z2 as the second coordinate, against Z3 as the third coordinate. So basically every row now just contains the coefficients uh, of uh, basically writing the projection of X onto the subspace in the basis spanned by Z1 to ZK. So you just write it in the basis. And that's all that's happening here. So you're just writing each of your vectors in the uh, the projection of X onto the subspace spanned by the vectors in Z. You just write it in that basis. That's all that's happening. And then you just scale the data up by root D over K. So it gives a very simple uh, procedure for projecting the data. Okay, just pick these randomly and uh, compute the embedding. Okay, so that's the johnson strauss transform. Pick z1 to k as random unit length of formal vectors and project the data to x times z, scaled by root d over k. And now if you just remind ourselves, there's a lot of similarity here to PCA. In PCA, you also choose z1 to k as uh, yeah, unit length of formal vectors. However, there we pick them depending on the data, right? So we look at x transpose x and we compute the eigenvectors and eigenvalues and we use the, the k eigenvectors corresponding to the largest eigenvalues and then we project the data x to x times z. So it's very much of the same flavor, just a different choice of z1 to zk, a different subspace. Now, what we'll show is that the johns lindstrass transform will actually preserve the distances between all these uh, data points when we embed them. So this is a nice property of the John Lindstrass transform. What PCA does, as we already argued, is that it guarantees uh, the best possible reconstruction if we try and project it back. So we look at the, the actual projected points. And as we saw in one of the previous videos, you can the, the projections onto the subspace, if you still write them in d-dimensional space, you can compute them by multiplying them back with set transpose. Okay, so this is, uh, this is what we saw earlier, so let's not spend too much time on it. But this is a way to try and reconstruct the original vectors. And uh, PCA gave the best possible reconstruction uh, if you constrain Z to have a unit, to basically be unit length orthogonal vectors being a basis of a k-dimensional subspace. And this is not something that the johnson lindstrauss transform guarantees. So, so they're different or incomparable. Uh, a benefit of the johnson lindstrauss transform is that it's much easier to compute set, right? You don't need to compute X transpose X and compute an eigen decomposition. Uh, 
And also in many applications, it's actually important that the set does not depend on the data. So you can actually choose it before you even see the data, which is also nice. Okay, so, so this is just a comparison between this johnson Instrust transform and PCA. So I would like to actually try and prove that this is, this is the case, that this works. Uh, however, this original analysis is a little tricky. And so what we'll do instead is we'll analyze a very similar construction that has an easier proof. Okay, so, so let's try and, and show that something almost identical to that construction up there uh, works. So just to uh, change notation to the way that the most literature on the johnson instrust transform is formulated, uh, we'll, we'll treat, if when we look at single uh, points, or single feature vectors, we'll think of them as column vectors. It's only when we have the data matrix that we place them as rows. But let's for now just think of them as column vectors. And what we want to do is we want to find a matrix A. And what we're going to do is we're going to embed them to A times XI. And with this notation up here, uh, this, this A just needs to be transposed and then it becomes the set up here just because of the way that we change the coordinates. Uh, so we're going to do A times XI. Up here, right, we, we have the flipped order here. It X, the data is on the left, the projection matrix on the on the right. It's just because we go back and forth between column vectors and row vectors. So this is just to be consistent with most of the literature. We're going to look for a matrix A. We're going to treat the vectors as column vectors and we want to embed them to AXI. Okay, so that's the only difference. So, okay, so what does the Johnson Instrust transform say? So here's another way of doing it, right? Before we said we had to choose random unit length orthogonal vectors. Here we're going to do something slightly different. So we have our n feature vectors, x1 to xn. These are the ones we want to project and we want to preserve the distances. And now we're given this precision epsilon, right? This is part of the input to the Johnson Instrust transform. We're given a precision epsilon. And what we're going to do is we're going to construct a random matrix L. And this random matrix L is going to be a scaling, one over root K times an A. And this A is going to be a K by D matrix. And each entry of A is going to be normally distributed with mean zero and variance one. And K is going to be some constant times one or epsilon squared log N. And, you know, before I said eight, you know, just, so just think of C as being eight. Uh, in the proof, we'll, we'll prove a slightly different, a slightly worse constant, but it doesn't matter so much. You know, the best known constant is, is eight. Okay, so, so, okay, what is going on here? So we have our feature vector x1 to, with coordinates x1 to xd. So this is one feature vector with coordinates. The matrix that we use for embedding is we're going to draw this random matrix A, where each of the entries is independently normally distributed with mean zero and variance one. And finally, at the end of it, we're going to scale by one over root k. So this is the L matrix, is this whole thing here. So I guess, as I said before, right, if you just call a slide ago, we said that we took a matrix set uh, with the random unit length orthogonal uh, columns, and then we scaled by root D over K. So this looks very different. So, so this is also why I mentioned that it's not exactly that formulation that we're going to analyze, but it's, it's very similar and it has a much simpler proof. So, so here it's just another matrix, and this is the embedding that we use. Uh, so, so in particular, uh, the entries, the, the rows of this matrix are not, uh, the rows of this matrix will correspond to the columns of sets, so the bases that we project onto. However, they're not going to be completely orthogonal because they're just normally still mean zero variance one. So they might actually have uh, non-zero inner products, these rows, and not necessarily orthogonal. And they're not unit length either, uh, but we have this scaling of one over root K, and this would actually mean that they, they should have very close to unit length all of the rows if we scale by one over root k. Um, and then, yeah, sorry, and then we have the root defect. So, so it's basically the same uh, construction, just random rows, random entries independently chosen. Okay. Now, okay, so what do we want to prove for this construction? So what we'd like to prove is that uh, if I pick my matrix randomly like this, without looking at the data, then there's a very good chance particular with probability at least one minus one over n. If I use this matrix L here to uh, embed my data, so I take every vector xi and I map it to L times xi. So this is the embedding of xi. This is the embedding of xj. Then the square distance between them is going to be within one plus minus epsilon of the original square distance. So, so basically what I'm saying is if I just do a random matrix like this and with high probability, 
is going to preserve all the distances between the input feature vectors uh, up to a factor one plus minus epsilon. Okay, so, so this is the construction. Uh, this L matrix is one over root K times A. A is this one here, and all the entries are normally distributed with mean zero and variance one. So what do we want to write? And our goal is to prove this, that if the number of dimensions is some constant times one over epsilon squared log N, then with probability one minus one over N, it holds for all the pairs of points, that the distance after embedding is within one plus minus epsilon of the original distance. Right? This is the goal and what we'll try to, to argue next. And so how are we going to prove it, right? So the proof is gonna have two steps. The first step is, to, is a kind of simpler statement. It says, okay, look at just one unit vector X. No, it doesn't have to be part of the input. Just say, we wanna prove that for any unit vector X, if I embedded using this L matrix here, the random matrix L, then the squared distance, the squared norm of this vector, right? So this is the norm of the embedded vector. The squared norm of it minus one is the probability that this is more than epsilon is no more than delta. Okay, so, so think about it, right? The original norm of a vector X uh, is one. So the squared norm is also one. So basically what we're saying here is that uh, the norm of X is preserved to within additive epsilon and X is a unit length vector. And here we have this delta parameter now. So delta now is a small chance that this fails. And what we're saying is that if K is at least some constant times one over epsilon squared times, times log one over delta, then the probability that this norm is off by more than epsilon is no more than delta. Okay, so that's the first thing we have to prove. The second thing we, we're gonna do is we're gonna now set delta in this expression up here to be one over N cubed. Okay, so this, this, this becomes log of N cubed. If we do this, then uh, what we're gonna show is based on the step one thing that we proved that all the pairwise distances between the input vectors are preserved with probability at least one minus one over n. So with very high probability, all the pairwise distances are preserved. So these are the two steps of the proof. Just move them up here, right? So one of them is to show that uh, if I have a unit length vector, then it's norm is preserved to within epsilon with high probability, except, so except with probability delta. And once this has been shown, we can show that uh, this implies we can use this uh, to argue that all the pairwise distances between endpoints are preserved with high probability. Okay, so I'm going to do it in reverse order. So I'm going to say, okay, let's start by assuming that we have already established step, step one here. Right? So let's say we already argued that for any unit vector, if I draw this random matrix, then this preserves its norm to within epsilon, uh, except with probability delta. Now let's try to do step two, assuming we have already done this. This is the simpler case. Okay, so what we're gonna do now is we're gonna look at some events that we don't like. Uh, so, so here's an event EIJ, and we have an event for every pair of input points. Right, so there's an XI and an XJ. And what does the event say? The event says that uh, the square distance between them is not within one plus minus epsilon of the original distance, right? So this is basically one of these unfortunate events of saying that the distance is not preserved at all. Okay, so, so this is a, an event we don't like, right? This is something unfortunate that we'd like to avoid. So what we wanna show now is our proof strategy is to show, well, the probability that either E1, E2 happens or E1, E3 or E1, E4 or EN minus one EN. So I'm looking at all pairs of points. I look at this event and I wanna say, what is the, what is the probability that at least one of them occur, right? Which is the probability that there's at least one pair whose distance is not preserved to within one plus minus epsilon. I wanna argue that this probability is no more than one over n. Okay. And why would I like to argue that then? Well, because now I can look at the complement event. So I look at the event that uh, basically the complement of all of this, that means that the complement event is that not even a single distance uh, is not preserved, right? So all distances are preserved. That's the complement event. And of course, like the complement event happens with probability one minus the probability that the event occurs. So if this, if there is a distance, if the probability is that there's a distance that is not preserved is no more than one over n, then the probability that all distances are preserved is at least one minus one over n. Okay, so. This is what we're aiming to show, right? So, so the goal now is to argue that the probability that there's at least one distance uh, 
that is not preserved is no more than one over n. We want to bound the probability of this giant or of events. So how do we handle all these ors of events? And this is something we saw way back when we looked at learning theory in the finite hypothesis case, we looked at the so-called union bound. So what does it say? So the union bound says that if I have a bunch of events that I typically, the events that I don't like, then the probability that at least one of these events occur is no more than the sum of the probabilities of the individual events, right? So this is some, we can basically prove it by picture. So if we like say, I draw an event as this cloud, whenever I land inside this cloud, the event occurs. And the, the R of a bunch of events means that I landed inside at least one of them. Right? So, and what am I saying? I'm saying that basically the area of the union of all these events, right? So the total area that these events cover is no more than the sum of the areas, which is obvious, right? Because sometimes I'm overcounting when I sum the areas when multiple events occur. So that's basically what the union bound says is the probability that at least one of a bunch of events occur is no more than the sum of the individual probabilities. So what we did was we defined these events, EIJ, that said that the norm or the distance between Xi and Xj is not preserved. And then we wanted to bound the probability that this event, that there is at least one of these events that occur. And what the union bound tells us is that, well, we can just bound the sum over the probabilities, right? So we bound the sum over all the pairs of points, I less than J, the probability that this pair of points uh, the distance between them is not preserved by the mapping L. Okay. Now, okay, so now we need to understand just the probability of one of these individual events, EIJ. And to understand this probability, right? So what we're going to do is that we, we would like to use the step one property. And if you remind you, it says something about unit length vectors. So let's try and see if we can turn this into a statement using unit length vectors. Right, so this is the statement here. This is the event. The event occurs if and only if um, applying L to Xi and L to Xj, taking the square distance, is not within 1 plus minus epsilon of the original distance. What I can do now is that use that L is a matrix, so it's a linear operation. So I can just rewrite this as L times, and now group together, Xi minus Xj. Okay. What I did here is I define a unit length vector V which is basically xi minus xj over the norm of xi minus xj, right? This is a vector and it has unit length. Okay, so what I'd like to do now is I'd like to introduce v over here on the, on the left. So what I can do now is I can take this xi minus xj and then I can write it as v times the norm of xi minus xj, right? Because then uh, the denominator up here cancels out with this factor and I get the original xi minus xj. Okay, so this is the same event still. What I do now is I can move this norm of xi minus xj outside the squared norm here. So a constant factor inside of the square of a norm, if I move it out, it squares. So this means I can take this and move it out and now it squares. And okay, so what do I have here? Now, if you look at this expression here, we have a, a term that occurs on both sides, right? We have the xi minus xj squared on the left xi minus xj squared on the right. So we can divide by it on both sides. And then we see that this original event, that the square distance between xi and xj is not within one plus minus epsilon of the original distance, is, is the same event as this vector v, the unit length vector v that we defined up here, that its norm after embedding, the square of its norm is not within one plus minus epsilon. This is the, exactly the same event. So what does this mean, right? It says that, well, L, this random matrix, the random projection, it fails to preserve the distance between Xi and Xj if and only if it fails to preserve the norm of V, right? So this is the exact same event where V is defined from Xi and Xj. Okay, so if we go back to this proof strategy, right? We defined, uh, we assume that step one has already been done. We're doing step two. We define this event that uh, the, the square distance between xi and xj after embedding is not within one plus minus epsilon of the original distance. We argued that the probability that it, this happens for at least one pair i comma j is no more than the sum of the probabilities. Then we argued that the probability, and we can say that the probability of one of these events is the same as if I take this vector v, it's a unit length vector defined from xi and xj, right? It's xi minus xj normalized by the norm of xi minus xj. 
the probability that this event occurs, the event that we fail to preserve the norm or the distance, is exactly the same as the probability that the squared norm of the embedding of V is not within one plus minus epsilon. All right, so this is the exact same probability. And now we can see we can use step one, right? Because step one, we are saying that if K is big enough, then for any unit vector X, the probability that the squared norm of LX is minus one is greater than epsilon is no more than delta. So basically what this is saying is that this probability down here is no more than delta, right? This is the probability that the squared norm is not within one plus minus epsilon, right? So this is at most delta, this probability of Vij. And then what we said in step two is that we're gonna set delta to be one over n cubed. So this probability of Eij is one over n cubed. And now, okay, so we have in one over n cubed here, now we have a sum over i less than j. So the sum over i less than j, one over n cubed, there's at most n squared pairs in the sum. And there's in fact, even a little bit less. So n squared divided by n cubed, that gives us one over n, right? So this is the reason why we choose one over n cubed is such that we can sum over all these n squared pairs and still get something small. So to summarize here, what did we show, right? So we showed that the probability that there is at least one pair of points where the, the square distance between the embeddings of xi and xj is not within one plus minus epsilon of the original this square distance is no more than one over n. And this is exactly what we wanted to prove. So this is basically, this means that the complement event, meaning that there's not even a single pair whose distance is off by more than one plus minus epsilon is at least one minus one over n. Right, so this is a this is basically so if we can show step one, then step two gets the job done, uh, with delta being one over n cubed. Okay, so what remains is to show step one here. So we want to show that if k is some big constant times one over epsilon squared times log one over delta, then it holds for any unit vector x that uh, the squared norm of l times x minus one. The probability that this is more than epsilon is no more than delta. So this is what we have to show uh, for this choice of matrix L. It looks like this. So to analyze this probability, uh, we need to look at uh, this, this product here of uh, this L with an X. So X is unit is a unit vector. So let's try and see what happens here. So let's look at one of the output coordinates of L times X. And actually let us zoom in on just A times X before we introduce the normalization factor one over root K. So let's look at A times X. So one of the output coordinates, say the ith coordinate, it's the inner product between the ith row of A and X, which means it's just the sum from one to D, Aij times Xj, right? That's exactly what the coordinate is. And now let's try to see how this is distributed, right? So it's the sum where we multiply each Xj with a normal distributed random variable with mean zero and variance one. So chord constant. So basically one can think of it here. So the unit vector X is fixed, right? So this is for any unit vector. So XJ is fixed, it's a constant times a normal distributed random variable means zero and variance one. And then we're summing up a bunch of these for independent uh, normal distributed random variables. So what we need is just a few properties of a normal distributed random variables. So there's two useful properties that we need. Uh, they're both rather simple. So the first one just talks about what happens if I multiply a normal distributed random variable with a constant C. In particular, it says that if I have a normal distributed random variable with mean zero and variance one, if then I look at C times A, then I get a normal distributed random variable with mean zero and var variance C squared, okay? Secondly, if I have two normal distributed random variables that are independent and that have variances sigma X squared and sigma Y squared, then if I sum them up, I get a new normal distributed random variable with this, still a mean of zero and the variance is just the sum of the variances. So these are the two properties that we'll be using. So if we go back here now, if we look at one of these terms in the sum, then the product here xj times aij is normal distributed with mean zero and variance xj squared. Each of the terms in the sum, the independent normal distributed random variables. So if I sum them up, the variances will sum, which means that the variance, the whole thing here is now normal distributed with mean zero and variance, the sum from one to D xj squared. 
Now, the sum of the squared entries of x is just the square norm of x, and the x is a unit vector, so it is just one. Which means now that the every output coordinate of the product a times x is just normal distributed, the mean zero and variance one. Right? So a very simple and distribution. So each coordinate of AX is independently normal distributed mean zero variance one. And the independence follows from using independent random variables in all the rows of, of A. Now, what we're interested in is the squared norm of say LX. So let's start by looking at the squared norm of A times X. And the squared norm of a vector is the sum of the squares of the entries. Each entry is normal distributed with mean zero and variance one. So the distribution of a times x, the squared norm of ax, is distributed as the sum of k squared independent normal distributed random variables with mean zero and variance one. That's exactly how it's distributed. Right. The sum of k squared independent normal distributed random variables with mean zero and variance one. Now, this distribution is actually very well studied. It's called the chi squared distribution uh, with k degrees of freedom. And it's denoted like this you have a chi subscript k superscript uh, 2 so the chi squared distribution with k degrees of freedom uh, this distribution is exactly what you get if you sum the squares of k normal distributed random variables with mean zero and variance one so there's a name for this distribution that the squared norm of ax has okay so the squared norm of a times x is distributed as is chi squared distributed with the k degrees of freedom now, the final embedding, right, is L times X. And the, so we have this one over root K normalization factor. And so the squared norm of L times X is just the squared norm of A times X over K. So it's distributed as a chi squared dis, uh, distributed random variable with K degrees of freedom divided by K. Okay. So now we know this. And now we basically what we're interested in understanding is how often is such a random variable uh, far away from one, right? That's exactly if we look up here at the topic and what we have to show is that uh, the probability that this random variable, the squared norm of LX is far away from one, epsilon away from one in particular is no more than delta. So, so we need to understand how, clo how, how close is this to one? Right, so we, this is the, the focus next. We want to know how close is such a distribution, how often such a distribution close to one. And here, like we saw with Höfting's inequality, we're just going to use a so-called tail bound or concentration inequality. And this is one we'll be using here. Uh, so this, this, this tail bound says that if I have a chi-squared distributed random variable with k degrees of freedom, then the probability that this variable over k is further away from 1 than epsilon is no more than uh, e to the minus 3 over 16 k epsilon squared. And this holds for any epsilon between 0 and a half. Right. So this is just a tail bound one can look up. Uh, there's mathematicians that have proved this concentration inequality. Okay, and, and what you can see up here, right, this is exactly the form that we have up here, right? Uh, our squared norm of Lx is exactly a chi-squared distribution with k degrees of freedom divided by k. This is a minus one, there's an epsilon. So, so this is what we get. And now we want to show that if I plug in this value of k up here, then I'm going to get delta over here on the right-hand side. So let's try and do this. So let's plug in our choice of k. So everything here is just noting that y over k here is the same as this distribution of uh, Lx, the square norm of Lx. So I, all I do is I plug in my choice of k. So I have my 3 over 16 with a minus. I have my c from k. I have my 1 over epsilon squared. I have my log 1 over delta. And then I have the epsilon squared here in the formula. So that's my epsilon squared. You can see the epsilon squares cancel out. So then you have e to the minus 3 over 16 c log 1 over delta. If we assume that c is some constant, right, is at least 16 over 3, then uh, in this choice of k here, then I get e to the minus log 1 over delta, which is exactly delta. Good. So this is if I choose k to be a constant times 1 over epsilon squared times log 1 over delta then I get this guarantee that the probability that the squared norm of Lx minus 1 is, um, is an absolute value greater than epsilon is no more than delta. OK, so going back, these were the two steps of the proof. We went through both of them now. And uh, let's just now finally see if we plug in as a session in step two. Right, We have to plug in delta being 1 over n cubed. 
So if we plug in that choice of delta, what does our k become in the formula above here, right? So our k is 16 over 3. To be concrete, right, we saw that 16 over 3 worked. 1 over epsilon squared, log 1 over delta. We plug in delta being 1 over n cubed. So this is n cubed. Now log of n cubed, the 3 just moves out, cancels out with the 3, and then we get 16, 1 over epsilon squared, log n. So, so basically, that, that is actually the full proof of why this Johnston Strauss transform work. I think in the beginning, I mentioned this, the state of the lemma with an 8 here instead of a 16. Uh, this is the, 8 is just the best known constant, and the analysis we just did, did uh, gives a 16. Okay, so just to summarize what the Johnston Strauss transform is doing, it's saying that I can choose a precision epsilon at least what we prove now, if I pick a random matrix like this, so I fill a matrix A with normal distributed random variables, mean zero and variance one, I normalize it by one over root K, then I can just take all my points and embed them to L times X. And this is gonna, with probability at least one minus one over N, it's gonna preserve the square distance between any pair of input points to within one plus minus epsilon with probability this one minus one over N. Provided that I set K to be some constant times one over epsilon squared times log N, we showed it with the constant C being 16. You can, again, do it with an eight. This has been shown. I guess in practice, uh, what you typically do is that you uh, you just choose some number of dimensions K that you embed into say a hundred if you, uh, or whatever you think you can afford. And then you just do it and um, just go with whatever quality that you get from this, right? You go, or you can maybe experiment with a couple of different choices of K for your application and, and see what works. Um, what is sufficient for you. Okay, but this is just the theoretical analysis showing uh, the guarantees that you get by using this random projection. Of course, the natural question is, you know, is this tight? Could we try, we have this, we have all these parameters, a very formal question, you know, uh, we wanna preserve the pairwise distance between all pairs of points in a set of endpoints to then one plus minus epsilon. Here we did it using some constant times one or epsilon squared times log n dimensions. Question is, could we embed into even fewer dimensions? And for instance, right, the Johnston Strauss transform that we just saw is a linear embedding, right? If you take some matrix and multiplies it onto the data, it's a dozen linear embedding. You know, maybe uh, you could do better if you do something non-linearly, right? Maybe you can use an autoencoder like we saw. Maybe autoencoders can do even fewer dimensions. Maybe you can always do even fewer dimensions. The answer is to this question is no, not in general. In fact, uh, by a result of my own, together with Jelani Nielsen from 2017, uh, we showed that there are actually uh, data sets consisting of endpoints or in vectors in RD, such that no matter how you embed them, you can use an autoencoder, you can use a neural net, you can do whatever you want, uh, no matter how you embed them, if you want to preserve the distances between all of the pairs to then this one plus minus epsilon, uh, then there's some constant C prime, so that you need number of dimensions that are at least C prime times one or epsilon squared times log n. So the constant does not match the one in the Johnson Instrust transform, but the dependency, the asymptotic dependency on the epsilon and the and the n uh, matches. So, so basically there's no hope of doing better asymptotically than what this Johnson Instrust, the random projection is doing. Right. Maybe just let me mention just uh, another useful extension. And this useful extension is that in this construction we just saw, right, the matrix A, we let all the entries be normal distributed, mean zero and variance one. If you're implementing it, this might be a little tedious to implement. Uh, and also the matrix, you know, you need to store a double a floating point number for each of the entries. Um, what you can show, the proof is more complicated, but what you can prove is actually the whole construction still works, still gets the same guarantees. If you replace all these normal distributed random variables uh, with just uniform random signs, so either minus one or one, uh, with probability half each and independent across the entries of the matrix, then it still works. And this is, is better to implement. You can it even suffices if it's storing, storing just a single bit for every entry of A. And also, you know, these are just nicer numbers to work with minus ones and ones when you're uh, computing the embedding. Good. So uh, the Johnson Instrust transform then again. The original formulation is just to just to compare with the PCA. Pick this, these these uh, vectors that wants to k as random unit length and orthogonal vectors and project the data to x times z with a normalization factor to it. We just saw a slightly different version where there was normal distributed random variables with mean zero variance one and a normalization 
term, uh, but it's basically the same construction. And in PCA, we chose, uh, we basically did the same. We predicted to X times Z. But we chose that one to set K as the K eigenvectors corresponding to the largest eigenvalues of X transpose X. So this is the, the difference between the two. The johnson lindstrauss transform has this guarantee that it preserves the distances between the points. The PCA guarantees the best reconstruction if we try and map them back to original vectors to the smallest distance, at least sum of distances between the projections of the points onto the subspace and the original points. This is not a property of the johnson lindstrauss transform. And the last property is that this johnson lindstrauss transform is much easier to compute. Uh, it doesn't even depend on the data. Right. And so it means that in something you can even choose it before you collect your data set. Okay. So this is, I guess, the last topic on uh, dimensionality reduction. Um,